Hey everyone, welcome to my Phys Edagogy presentation. What do we know about effective online teaching in physical education and how might that be useful to me or to us translating research to practice? My name is Chad Killian. I'm an assistant professor at Georgia State University in Atlanta in the Department of Kinesiology and Health. I work in the Health and Physical Education program strand. Got my bachelor's in Health and Physical Education and then taught for five years in central Pennsylvania. And while I was teaching, like many of you, I got my uh, master's degree, um, and then I went to the University of Illinois and got my PhD in kinesiology, where I mostly studied the use of online instruction in secondary physical education. Just to put it out there, I don't like technology, uh, but I see its value and potential in supporting quality physical education, um, and that's why I chose to study it. I'll be on the unhangout. Hopefully, I'm there now. Um, so please ask questions, share your experiences related to the topics that we're discussing. Don't hesitate to offer your feedback or comments um, because I want this to be a productive conversation um, more than me just talking at you. Um, so I hope you find this presentation in interesting, enriching, and thought-provoking. I'll provide a little bit of background um, before I get into some, some of the relevant research on this topic. Um, but mainly I want to offer practical implications um, and give you some strategies that might be able to apply to your teaching. Um, and at the end, I'll share some resources that my team and I developed to support and model good practice based on some of the research that we've done. So what in the world just happened? Well, regardless of what you thought about online teaching and physical education before this, um, all of us, myself included, had to adapt. Um, pretty rapidly to teaching within an online environment. Um, and we're not really sure what that means for the future. Um, my guess is most schools now are sort of online till the end of the school year, um, and administrators are probably in the midst of planning what the fall is going to look like, and that will be determined by sort of the trajectory of and the waves of the virus. Um, but there's a high likelihood that many teachers could be required to teach remotely into the fall. Um, and what what might that look like? Um, even if you're not teaching online, if, if you go back to work, uh, back to school um, and you start the school year face to face, um, we're not really sure what that format will look like. Um, but many teachers might be required to have an online backup. Um, blended learning might be a, become a priority. Um, and so a lot of this is up in the air, but I think we, it's safe to say that we're going to be using online learning for a little bit longer than just this school year. But is that really new? Like, is this a new thing? Well, schools have sort of been changing. Um, whether it's impacted you or your school uh, might be up, up in the air, but, but generally speaking, educational approaches, structures are sort of evolving to meet 21st century students needs. Um, new research is informing these practices and so what we're seeing um, across the country is is the adoption of blended and the development of blended schools where some of the content is delivered online and some of the content is face to face and so the Hoosier Academy in Indianapolis is one of many examples of a school like this. There's also year-round schools, and, and a lot of those uh, the schools that are adopting these schedules are private schools, um, but many public schools that do are um, online or charter schools. There's night schools where students can work or attend college classes uh, or take care of their children, and they go to night schools to finish their degrees. Schools are, schools are evolving, and what we need to ask ourselves is what are the implications of this? A shift towards collaborative technology-infused approaches to education, non-traditional scheduling. What does this mean for physical education within the COVID context and beyond? And then what is the role of the physical education teacher within these contexts? We really don't know what the future will look like. But what we can say is online learning is expanding as a legitimate modality for teaching and learning. If it hasn't impacted your school before this, it's certainly going to impact your future as a teacher. And the longer uh, and the more research and 
The more time that passes, expectations related to quality will increase and become more rigorous. So what I want to encourage you all to think about and what I'm thinking about as a college teacher is how I can plan for the future now so that I can save work on the on the, the back end. So we need to first ask ourselves, what is the potential value of quality online physical education? And this is based on a theory um, developed by Michael Beats out of South Carolina uh, called the theory of expanded, extended, and enhanced opportunities for youth physical activity promotion. It's a mouthful, but basically I think this theory supports the value that online physical education could provide. Using online modalities can expand physical activity opportunities beyond the gym by encouraging students and holding them accountable to be physically active outside of school. <clears throat> In the same way, quality online physical education has the potential to extend physical activity opportunities beyond the 45 minute or 50 minute physical education class period that many students are restricted to. So they can be active longer than that if they would like. And quality online physical education has the potential to enhance physical activity opportunities by reducing class sizes in face-to-face -face, and by giving students that are enrolled in, this, in the online modalities more autonomy to choose physical activities that they might enjoy more than what's offered currently within the face-to-face -face environment. It re quality online physical education represents another environment where students can find meaningful opportunities to be physically active. Doesn't need to take the place although it is sort of right now, but in the future, when we get back to face-to-face, -to -face, we can still maintain an online environment if that would suit your students' needs. It really allows for self-directed and independent learning. It meets the communication style of students today. It allows them to express their individuality by sort of being active in environments where they, they're most comfortable. It provides them with autonomy and choice. So it can fit with sort of the, the characteristics of students today. It also, it also can prepare students for life after high school. Um, and so if you look at the top trends, uh, wearable technology is number one, and uh, a lot of the surveillance that's done or the accountability or the, the support uh, is through wearable technology within an online environment. And so we can really help them navigate how to be active um, starting in high school so that when they get to college, when they get to, to the workforce, they, they can continue to have is that, that they've developed in a supportive physical education environment um, once they leave the support of the high school. Uh, before we get into the research, I want to touch base and sort of define all the different uh, modalities of online learning. And so the Digital Learning Collaborative is a really, really, um, really cool resource. They have all sorts of uh, different policy statements, but their snapshot 2020 gives sort of an idea of what um, what the situation is like within the within the online and blended environment K to 12. Um, and if we go down here, we can kind of see these are all the different dimensions of online programs. So any of you that have online programs in your schools now, um, it probably fits within one of these categories. Comprehensiveness is it supplemental or is it full time? Is it district, multi-district, state uh, designed? Is location in the school, at the home, other? Is it delivery asynchronous where students can sort of engage at will or is it synchronous where they have time to meet, et cetera? So online learning is simple in that it means you use the online as a delivery mode, but uh, in its sort of highest form or in its structured form, it can take many different um, it can look many different ways. So I wrote an article on flipped learning uh, back in 2016. This appeared in Physical Education and New Technologies. Um, to my knowledge, along with Ove Osterley's chapter on the same topic. These were sort of the first articles that sort of tried to describe what flipped learning within physical education looked like. Um, so if you're interested in reading a little bit about that, you can check out that article and the link is provided at the end of this 
slideshow. But basically what we see flip learning as is a way to sort of expand and extend physical activity. So in a traditional PE class, you've got your management, you know, whatever percentage of time you spend in that, this is just arbitrary, but you know, a percentage of class time spent in management, a percentage of class time is spent in instruction and potentially assessment, and a percentage of class time is in students being physically active. This all happens within the class period and the school day. Well, if we take some of that instruction and put it online, that shrinks the amount of instruction and assessment that occurs within the class, theoretically leaving a vacuum to be filled, hopefully, by physical activity. So in an observational sense, that's the value that we saw flipped learning um, could have to quality physical education. So we did a study, five lessons, um, and compared um, an invasion games unit, a soccer unit, um, conducted in a seventh grade physical education class, all boys. So one class had standard lessons taught face-to-face -face and verbal uh, instruction. One class had flipped videos where they engaged with the videos during homeroom and then were physically active in class. And so you can see the differences in the activities just from the lesson plans. So this was lesson plans for lesson one. This is what happened in face-to-face -face class. The flipped class was able to get to do an extension and a closure portion of the unit or the lesson because they engaged with the instruction piece in homeroom. Same way, an extension activity was provided in the flipped lessons. The standard lessons didn't quite get there. Um, they were similar as we got to lessons three and four because there was a shift towards more, um, the routines were already set, the activities were sort of established in prior classes, and most of the class was physical activity and, and practice. Um, but when we get to lesson five where there was a test, lesson five, these students had to sit on the gym floor and take their assessments, whereas these students got to have a free choice day at the end because they already did their assessments online in homeroom. We did a SOFIT observation, with this, which is a system for observing fitness instruction time. It's a systematic observation tool that sort of um, uses ecological time sampling and um, basically it identifies the amount of MVPA, the lesson context, and the teacher involvement. And so if you look at this, the most important thing here, I'm sure what most people are looking at are the MVPA minutes or the, the, the minutes in moderate to vigorous physical activity. So lesson one standard, there was nine minutes of physical activity. The flipped had 15. Lesson two, the standard, the traditional face-to-face -face had 17 minutes of MVPA, flipped had 22. Big time difference in lesson three, 21 minutes to 30. Um, and if we go down to lesson five, it was 16 minutes to 28 minutes because they were take the standard face-to-face -face class was taking the assessment. These students were having a free day. But you can see that most of the class for the face-to-face -face was focused on knowledge acquisition and, and, and verbal teaching. That's the difference that we saw is because they were receiving instruction from the teacher, they were spending less time in MVPA, whereas the flip students received less knowledge during class because they received that online already, so they were able to engage in more physical activity. In the same way, the skill practice was very different, so there was less skill practice in the face-to-face -face because there was more instruction. So you can see the differences, and these are percentage of class time. 70% of class time in lesson one was spent on skill practice, whereas only 26% in the standard. So you can imagine if we continued using flipped learning throughout the year, there's a higher probability of skill acquisition simply by using flipped instruction. I mean, you can kind of see differences in teacher behavior. So you can see that they definitely were spending 34% of class instructing the whole class and down the line. So these, these sort of identified in an empirical or sort of a objective sense, 
what we sensed with the graphic that I showed. So all in all, there was an additional seven minutes of MVPA per lesson for students in flipped. And what that means is over the course of five lessons, that's an additional 34.4 minutes of MVPA, which is basically an additional PE class without an additional day in PE, which is pretty substantial from a policy standpoint, if you think about it. So this was a pilot study. It was, a, it was a, an observational study, um, but it, it demonstrates the potential value of flip learning. And if you're not using it now, it might be something to think about um, for different lessons, particularly ones that, um, that might have a little bit more instruction or, or lessons that are earlier on in a unit um, because there tends to be more instruction in those. So if you can put some of that online, you can spend more time being active with students potentially. We conducted another study um, on factors that influence teachers' adoption of a supplemental online physical education curriculum. And this was supplemental, so while they had a traditional face-to-face -face class that was a, a fitness-oriented class, they had health-related fitness knowledge happening at the same time online. Um, the curriculum was billed as a blended curriculum, so it was meant to be embedded within the face-to-face. Um, but the way this played out, it was um, parallel. The students engaged in it autonomously while the teachers did their face-to-face -face, and there was very little mention of it. But why the heck did these teachers decide to adopt an online, a supplemental online curriculum? Well, they saw that there were programmatic improvements, uh, instructional improvements, and they felt that having the supplemental instruction allowed them to address their students' needs better. Um, and these are responses, and you can read the quotes while I provide a little bit more context. These are responses from 28 teachers that used a supplemental curriculum. Uh, they had an average of 23 years teaching experience, and 20 out of the 28 either coached, had administrative duties, or both. And so sort of offhand, what people would think about teachers who were likely to adopt technology would tend to be younger. You would think that they would be, tend to have less responsibilities um, from an administrative or coaching perspective and more time to learn the system. And that just wasn't the case. And it wasn't the case because it was pretty easy for them to use um, as they were addressed uh, or as they were exposed to the curriculum, they decided to use it because it took very little personal effort. Um, and they also considered students' effort that it would need, and they found that um, it was manageable from the student standpoint. So they valued it from a programmatic instructional aspect. They found it easy to use, and they found it easy for students to use. And they were also supported. Um, most of them had school and school policy and technology initiatives that allowed them to sort of uh, align with. The IPE was the, the curriculum, um, that the supplemental curriculum program, um, and they provided unbelievable support, which um, helped teachers during their adoption of the curriculum. Um, and some, some of the teachers actually didn't have a whole lot of support from the school, but it didn't stop their use because the external support that they provide, that they received from IPE um, was pretty, pretty substantial. And they did consider students facilitating conditions. So students um, in their schools, even if they didn't have access to Wi-Fi, the schools provided um, time during study halls to work on their computers or time before and after school. So um, they were willing to adopt this curriculum because they felt supported and they knew that their students were supported as well, even ones with accessibility issues. And they really didn't care that other people thought about it. They found so much value in it. They felt supported. It was easy enough that, you know, people in their department that didn't really support their use were kind of, they could be ignored because all the other things outweighed that social influence. <clears throat> but the price was uh, the, the, the ultimate. Um, the program was free when they started because it was a uh, beta testing. Um, but then when they went to a price model, a lot of the teachers had to stop using it because the school wasn't uh, willing to, to support uh, uh, 
a physical education exclusive online learning management system. So what does that even what does that mean from a personal teaching takeaway standpoint? Uh, find online tools if you're planning to use online, and at least for this time, find ones that provide value in your mind and to students. Um, make sure that you can justify why you're putting the resource up or why you're using a curriculum and understand how it fits into the broader philosophy of your program. And use tools and systems that are easy to learn and navigate. Keep it simple. Okay, there's a lot of flash, there's a lot of, um, you know, complicated, really cool things that could support students learning. But if it's going to be so much of a burden on you, it might be worth starting simple and building your program over the years. Um, you don't have to start all in all at once. Choose something that's easy, something that you can navigate so that it's a pleasant experience for you as well. Um, advocate for yourself and seek support. Um, you deserve professional development. You deserve support from your school. And if they're not going to give it to you, find a friend that knows technology. I've relied on a lot of friends that, that know technology and um, it is helpful to have somebody you can talk to and be supported by and um, a lot of the tools are intimidating at first but you know you get some support you can tinker around with them and you might surprise yourself um, in how quickly you learn so definitely advocate for yourself and seek support and I would recommend using free and school issued sanction and sanctioned tools um, if your school uses canvas it's probably a good idea to use canvas and not google drive um, it, it makes it easier for the students to maintain consistency and anything that happens within the you know if something happens in the discussion board or if there's a technical issue um, schools are able to handle it if it's conducted on an in-house system they could probably handle it a little bit better so even if you're comfortable with Google Drive or another free learning management system, it always makes sense from a security and from sort of a, a policy standpoint to use your school sanctioned learning management system. So then we asked students what they thought of their experiences using the same supplemental online curriculum. First and foremost, they did it but they did it when it was convenient. Um, they also agreed, you know, the teachers said that it would be easy for students and students confirmed that, but it was almost so easy uh, to use that they were, it was also easily ignored. Um, and the, the key finding in this study is that students felt it was very disconnected from physical education. You can see some quotes from students that we interviewed down here. <clears throat> they didn't quite understand why it wasn't being embedded into their face-to-face -face class. Here are a couple more quotes and you can read those. Um, but again, it, it highlights the importance of the teacher in helping students understand why the heck they're using online in what most would perceive as a movement-oriented course. Help them understand the value of the online content. And if they don't have value, the priority won't be there. Um, we all know that PE in many ways is a marginalized subject. Hopefully in your school it's not, um, but you know, compared to AP chemistry and, and social studies and reading and math, um, a lot, you know, the culture of PE historically hasn't been sort of high on a lot of people's priority list, but there are a lot of quality teachers out there and there's a lot of quality online content. And so if you can help students understand the value of that, um, we can we can hope someday that students will prioritize our content. Um, so practical takeaways to ensure meaningful student experiences. The content's got to be relevant. It's got to be useful. It's got to be engaging and appropriately challenging. So you know, be in contact with your students. Ask them how how it's going. What they thought about the modules or what they thought about you know the the activities that you gave them online, so that you can adapt and adjust according to their relevance use engaging and appropriate challenge you got to help students understand the relevance this is so important they need to know why they're engaging and what they're engaging in um, and why it's useful even if they can't see it now why it might be useful down the road um, 
and why using online can support their learning. You know, you, you want to focus your face to face on being physically active and, and enriching and engaging. And you might not be able to get to all the content. Um, and so, yeah, we're going to put some stuff online. It's going to really support what we do in class. You're going to kind of get a little bit different picture. You're going to be able to extend what we learned about, um, you know, however you want to pitch it, so to speak. But, you know, they got to understand why you're using online um, once COVID is over. Um, and supporting their transition is very important. Um, you know, online learning is new to the students, whether, you know, even though they use social media, they use their phones, they use, they might use online learning um, as part of other classes. Learning online in physical education is a very new thing. Um, and it's new for you as well. So you got to help them understand, help them transition, be a little bit more flexible in the beginning, um, help them get into good habits, good uh, routines related to their engagement um, so that, you know, two, three, four weeks in, they can they can have a chance of being successful. It also reduces stress on your year end as well. So then so that was a supplemental and this is the last study that we'll touch on, but this is a fully online physical education course and we interviewed students who are participating in this as well. Um, and we have a couple main um, preliminary themes, but you can see that from this quote and, and others like it, um, that students appreciated the flexibility of a fully online elective physical education course from a personal health standpoint. They didn't have to wake up real early and go to zero hour. They didn't have to change fourth period um, and shower before lunch. Um, they could be active outside of school, which a lot of them appreciated. And these are high school students. From a lifestyle standpoint, because they were taking an online course and didn't have to take a PE class during the school day, um, their schedule is more flexible so they can have an early release. And they appreciate flexibility from a physical activity standpoint. You can see their perception of physical, these students' physical education perceptions um, weren't quite as positive as we would want. But these are the same students in the previous quote, this is the group talking about their physical activity that they engage in as part of the online course. They're able to get credit for their dance classes. And you can see that they're very excited compared to what they thought of their physical education class. Doesn't mean the class was bad, it just means they weren't as engaged in the physical education class and now they could get credit for being physically active um, in a dance class. It wasn't all positive. Um, again, the online instruction piece, the knowledge component, the APEC component wasn't engaging for a lot of reasons, um, which limited perceived value and their engagement um, with it. Um, and the physical activity component was a demotivator for some. So it's going to be really important for anybody that issues a, an elective online course in middle school or high school um, that you tune your physical activity so that it's manageable for students um, because these students felt it was unfair for them to be required to be phys more physically active than the students in physical education classes. Um, but that's an easy solution. You just kind of play around with the physical activity requirements till you find something that, that works for everyone. So most of the students that we interviewed, and this isn't generalized, there's a lot more students that we, we didn't, there are more, way more students that we didn't talk to than we did, but um, the 37 students in this study, which was incidentally the same as the other study, but it was two different studies, um, they appreciated the flexibility. They might be more active and appreciative if the engagement is autonomous. So students have an opportunity to enroll in an online course might actually be more active um, because it's on their terms, um, not the teacher's terms. Um, and make sure you're flexible and pro uh, progressive with physical activity requirements um, and mindful of the online workload so that you're not burdening students and, and creating a situation where they're being motivated. Um, but that's, that's where you sort of approach this as an iterative process where you play around with the physical activity requirements, you get feedback from students, and um, you kind of make something that works for your students and the students enrolled in your class and your school context. Because at the end of the day, there's, I mean, these are just a couple studies and, and um, 
there isn't a whole lot of other research in online uh, learning from students and teachers' perspectives. Um, there's a little bit more on flip learning from uh, Dr. Sargent and Dr. Osterley, um, but but for the most part, the evidence base isn't where it needs to be yet. And so it's up to you, if you're teaching online, to take a ref reflective approach and, and almost take a research approach to your own environment. Um, you gotta notice what's happening, consider it, plan to continue or adjust if it's not working well, um, because you're free to explore. This is all novel, the evidence base is still being built, um, and so your own gym ecosystem um, is sort of an environment where you're free to experiment, explore, and iterate towards what's optimal to your students. At the end of the day, you gotta create effective practice for your school, your school district, your classes, um, and then that'll take some time, but it's kind of a kind of a cool thing and a cool approach um, if you can take that type of attitude and not stress too much about you know creating a perfect class year one. You know it's going to take some time, um, but with a reflective approach, you can kind of build towards that each iteration. So since there's not a whole lot of evidence, you know we've we've conducted several studies that I've reviewed. There's several more studies that were um, in the process of conducting. And so during the rapid transition, my team and I wanted to apply some of that research and give some rapid help to teachers um, where there is a little bit of evidence in what we did. So we created five uh, lessons, five modules um, within what we call understanding physical activity for wellness, quote unquote, curriculum. Um, and so these are on our Google Drive and we designed these because we wanted to provide um, rapid support to teachers and ultimately support uh, middle school and high school students um, in a very uh, chaotic time. Um, and so this is just kind of our vision of what we were trying to do and, it, and it, you know, you can kind of see it helped us as designers. It models good practice for PEAT students in the PEAT community. Um, but it provides a direct, practical, relevant um, tool for you all so that you can help your students manage and thrive. And so if you're interested, we've got five modules. They can find them my, you can find them on my Twitter um, or you can click on this uh, link. These slides are in the Google Drive for Phys Edagogy, so you can go there and all the links are live in this slideshow, which is on those. Uh, which isn't in the Phys Edagogy drive. So up to you how you want to access these if you want to take a look around. But for the sake of presentation, you know, you come to the Google Drive. We've got five modules. Every module has a support video. So this gives um, some tips, highlights, and strategies for implementation. The watch, listen, and read has the slideshow. And every slideshow has a recorded YouTube video with a voiceover of the content. Um, but what we're recommending in our teacher support videos is that you delete this first slide. You take a look at the content. You can take a, a read through some of the resources and try recording your own voice over the slides. That will provide students an opportunity to hear your voice um, it'll provide you an opportunity to practice some technology. Um, and if you're comfortable with that, we would encourage you to do that, maybe at some of the later modules if you choose to use these. Um, but again, we have video uh, voiceovers if, you're, uh, if you don't want to do that. Content overview is here. So we have all the objectives, essential questions in case your school district would need that. Um, and you know, you can get creative with these. Each lesson doesn't have to be one week. You know, you can have a two week, uh, a two week window where students are being physically active related to the, to the content here. And that's a 10 week curriculum. So um, you can be creative and use these however you see fit. Um, there are some assessment resources here. So there's a, a short quiz. There's a reflection if you wanna use reflections. There's a SMART goal worksheet. Um, there's a written assessment. You know, these are more designed for you to see 
So this is actually the quiz, um, a different quiz. But these are just ideas. Um, you know, ideally, you all would adapt these assessments to your students' needs. Um, but we provided the content. We provided some assessment ideas, some movement ideas. Um, there's some internet resources and some shared documents. If you create any, you can kind of put those in there. Um, but at the end of the day, you can use it, use the content um, in ways that you see fit for your own students. Really what we want to encourage and what I want to encourage is teaching online is still teaching. Regardless of how you choose to use our modules or develop your own content, um, just be mindful of your comfort and experience. Be mindful of your context and what's possible. Be mindful of your students' needs and create something or find resources that address those needs. Um, you might need to pivot away from the skill-based focus of your class and focus on some of the more psychological, physical, social outcomes that we highlight in our modules. Um, but think about what meaningful experiences might look like and plan, develop, and implement them. Find support. I'll tell you right now, you shoot me an email anytime, I'm willing to help. I had phone conversations with multiple teachers that I don't even know because they reached out. I'm happy to support you all in any way that I can. Um, and so please feel free to reach out, reach out to your community. Um, and I think the more time that goes on, moving into next school year, um, the quality of some of the resources will increase, the, the number of resources will increase. So just be reflective about what you're using, be reflective about your experiences, be intentional about what you plan, sort of look toward the future, not just trying to fill a gap. Um, take an iterative approach. Don't try to be perfect right off the bat, or you'll go crazy over the summer. Um, you know, take a manageable, deliberate approach, create something or use resources that work um, and be encouraged. You got through eight, 10, 12 weeks of online teaching. It might not have been pretty. It might have been real frustrating. Um, it probably was. It was for me. <laughs> uh, but, you know, you did it. You never thought you would. I never thought, you know, I researched this stuff. I'm like, oh, man, I got a five year plan. I'll release some of this stuff, you know, two or three publications a year. Nobody will read them because nobody cares about online. And then this thing hit. And it's like, well, here we go. You know, here we go. Everybody sort of hit the gas pedal and had to kind of accelerate um, toward, you know, the future or whatever. And and so I'm right alongside with you guys and girls. Um, and we all can be encouraged because we all did it and we're all going to do it probably into the fall. Um, and so another way to just sort of frame online instruction is advocacy. You know, as you iterate, as you reflect, as you choose your resources, as you develop your resources, everyone's gonna see it. We can really use this opportunity to show the value of physical education because what we put online, your community, your principal, your parents will see. Um, and so think of ways that you can invite the community, the, the families into meaningful physical education, physical activity. What you suggest students do as physical activity can really have an impact on their social and, and on their family physical activity as well. You know, it might be two days, set a goal this week and choose two nights where you go for a walk before or after dinner with uh, at least one person that you live with. Reflect on that experience and, and, and think about how you felt from a physical standpoint after the walk, from a social standpoint, a relational standpoint after the walk. Um, and think about if that's something you might want to do in the future and why or why not. Um, there are a lot of different ways you can do that and online gives a little bit of a creative um, outlet for, for those types of invitations. Um, and then ultimately though, use discretion when posting your content assessments and invitations. We want to make sure it reflects good, good quality practice, um, deliberate planning, sort of standards alignment. So be sure that you can show all that stuff um, because when you put it online, it goes out to the community. And if it's good, it's advocacy. And that's a good thing. So again, schools are changing, students are changing. Um, and you know we don't know what the new normal is going to be, but I think we can safely say at least at the secondary, middle school and high school level that 
e-learning is probably going to become more and more of an expectation a little bit quicker than it might have had this pandemic not happened. And so plan with that in mind, plan with value, plan with, with intention um, and see how you might be able to build something that can be useful beyond just these extended school closures. All the reference links are right here. Um, I hated to put some to my research gate, um, but if you can't have access to the journals, um, you can go to the research gate and send me a message and I'll send you the articles. All the articles here are there are, are available um, either right off the bat or through research gate. So feel free if you're interested, you can check those out. For more information, you can follow me on Twitter. I kind of released some stuff um, about the modules and stuff. And we've got some bigger stuff planned. So um, I'll try to use the common hashtags if you don't feel like following me. So hopefully you can see that stuff. But I'm here to support you all. Um, I got some YouTube videos out um, just kind of sharing my thoughts kind of like this. Um, if you're interested in any of our research, um, I've done some other stuff that I didn't mention. Um, if you want to get a doc doctoral degree, come down to GSU. We've got a good program. Um, love to work with you. Um, and like I said, please feel free. Just if you have any questions, send me an email. This is stuff that I've been thinking about for, for a while. Um, and my intention is to support you all um, as best I can. So wish you all the best. Hopefully you found uh, value in this. Hopefully the chat was on fire and we, we, we got through some stuff. Um, but I'll be I'll try to hang around and, and keep the conversation going if, if things are good. So um, thanks again for spending a Saturday morning with me. I uh, wish you guys all the best um, as you kind of continue thinking through this. Take good care.